So um, we're really talking about two ways to implement the saga pattern that Kendall just talked about, and they are orchestration versus choreography. Now, if you Google this term, orchestration versus choreography, you're going to see a lot of content because people have lots of different opinions about what's better. Um, and in essence, they're uh, both very different ways to, to accomplish pretty much the same thing. And I'm not going to deep dive into each one of them specifically today. Um, what I can say is that uh, today we'll show you how to combine the two, but we're going to be very much orchestration focused. But that's not to say that this pattern is better than the other one. So just at a high level, uh, choreography, which is here on the right, is really akin to what you know from pub sub or message-driven systems, where you have a bunch of processes, and these are um, these circles here, and you basically need to create a, a change of flow in the system that changes state by um, going through a uh, event broker. And the event broker has subscribers and publishers, and they are all decoupled from each other. So a publisher can publish a state message, not knowing who's going to pick it up, and that's where their job stops. And so um, this is really about uh, doing choreography for uh, decoupled players, and they can change their own database. They can all share the same database. It, it doesn't really matter from that perspective. Um, it's all left to uh, the implementer to decide how to share state. But this is called uh, the decentralized architecture, whereas with orchestration to the left here, you basically get this centralized brain or know-it-all process, um, something that acts like a coordinated transactions manager uh, that is very much aware of all of the different things that, that are happening. And um, some of the processes also have you know, some idea about each other um, because they might be sharing the same business models, the same business domain models. And they basically ex execute on state that's being updated and delivered to them through this coordinated way. Um, and so if you uh, look at some things that came out, like blog posts around this, this came out from Temporal um, back in July in 2023. Um, a really nice blog post called uh, to choreograph or orchestrate your saga. That is the question. Um, and, you know, spoiler, uh, the Temporal really went for the uh, uh, orchestration route, um, although they, they did a, a pretty good job of explaining, you know, both sides and pros and cons and stuff. They're all about orchestration. Um, then another blog post came uh, sometime later by Bill Ginebriam called choreography or orchestration. That's the wrong question. And I really agree with this um, because I am older now. So if you'd have asked me a few years ago, I would have probably, you know, chosen either choreography or orchestration. I would have uh, zealously, you know, chosen the the, the pros and and went with that. But um, as I developed more systems and as I saw more systems being developed, especially in the cloud native world, which is just abound with different tools and different processes and, um, you know, different people coming up with different ideas for how different systems should look like, uh, I realized that it, it shouldn't be either or, it should really be a choice. What you're looking for in a modern system are APIs and, uh, you know, tools that allow you to choose the, the best tool for the job for what you want to do. So it might be uh, choreography for one thing and or orchestration for another. But then if you can actually enable those two things together, then you, you really get the, the best of both worlds. Um, and this is something that we really tried to put into Dapper, the open source project, right from the get-go. We really wanted to make it um, be this tool where you can implement different APIs and achieve very complex architectures by combining them and not necessarily by you know, choosing a specific programming model. Right, so Dapper has something called Actors, for example, which is really great for IoT um, or gaming. But you know, using Actors, you can also um, use orchestration or choreography um, from within those um, domain business logic that, that you have. So uh, this is another really great blog post. I encourage everyone to go read it. It's awesome. And this is uh, the AWS reference architecture for the Saga pattern. So if you go on AWS's um, website for their uh, reference architectures and you search for Saga, you're going to come into this. And this is how they are um, uh, creating the, the reference architecture now. This is reference, meaning you can implement this thing in a number of ways. But on AWS, they, they have a service called AWS Step Functions, um, which is really tied to Lambda. 
and um, they basically give you this blueprint that you can enable um, using things like uh, SNS for notifications and 9MoDB. But the, the interesting thing that you'll see here is that even this is sort of combining uh, the best of both worlds. So this is very much focused um, on uh, choreography. And, sorry, orchestration, which is uh, done through the centralized service, which in this case is AWS Step Functions. But um, if you can see the sending SMS uh, success activity here, um, that's actually sending a pub sub message to notify a downstream subscriber that an event has occurred. Um, so this is really about combining the best of both worlds. Now, why is this important to combine them? Because you can't do anything um, right with, with just one of them. And let me go back. Uh, here a second, right? So um, in case you have a very heavy CPU or memory-based uh, execution and you just want to notify someone to do something like, you know, send a notification that some process in your system succeeded and you want to notify someone by text or email or something like that, um, then you probably don't want to necessarily include that as a separate activity in your orchestration pipeline um, because orchestration tends to be more resource heavy um, on your system because you have the concept of rollbacks and state dehydration. And so you really just want to send something off through an event broker to let someone know that something has happened after the main orchestration um, has finished. So this is just one example of why you do want, want to combine the both, but uh, both of them, sorry, but you can also do it for any other number of reasons. For example, if you need to um, include, you know, um, state coming in or change notifications from systems that you don't have control over, right? Because orchestration is great um, as long as you can basically put it inside of your code. And that's code that's under your control. It's in your CI CD pipelines. Uh, but once you're dealing with uh, systems that, you know, don't necessarily um, uh, fall under your responsibility, it might be a different team or, you know, even a different third party system, then PubSub really helps there. And a lot of systems just use this model. So I think I made this point pretty clear, being able to combine the two uh, is great, but um, the really, really nice benefit of using um, orchestration um, is that you can actually get all of the benefits of coding like a monolith while still getting all of the benefits of being a distributed microservices based uh, service. So the nice thing about being a monolith is you have less code to maintain, it's less cognitive overhead to try and understand where things are. From a CICD perspective, it's definitely easier. You have less code that you need to deploy, monitor, patch, downgrade, upgrade, maintain, um, less things that you need to uh, test for in isolation to see that they all play nicely. These are really great benefits of, of a monolith. And so um, this type of, of model um, doing it through orchestration really gives you the ability to treat your code as if it's a monolith, but um, in, in a system like Dapper Workflows, which is uh, the basis for Catalyst Workflows or in other workflow engines, um, you, you really get the, the benefit of being able to scale out your application um, to multiple instances and have them orchestrate and execute multiple workflows, each with their own inputs. Um, eventually reaching to the end goal, which is different outputs and being able to run to their completion, you know, talking to the same database or different database. So you really get all of the benefits of a microservices based architecture um, with a monolithic code base, which is really nice. And we'll, we'll show that here now. So uh, moving forward uh, in, in this example, um, we see basically how locked in, I, I would say this architecture is because AWS Step Functions uh, must run on Lambda. So uh, you see that you have DynamoDB here and SNS and, and Lambda, um, and that can work great, but it also has some uh, challenges to it. Um, and these challenges come in many forms. So, um, and this really comes into play in many things. First of all, um, for step functions, you need to maintain uh, two definitions of your system. One is JSON or YAML based, which person as developer, I don't like, like you, you can just have it be pure workflow as code, it always must come with a JSON file that I'll show you in a second, that will eventually grow as your code grows. So as you actually grow your business and grow your code, you get more overhead in terms of needing to maintain these separate definitions and test them together and make sure that they're aligned. Um, and then the code itself is really split all over the place. So you have to run these things as different Lambda functions and they have their own challenges. Um, and these challenges are chiefly the following. First of all, you're locked into using only AWS Lambda. The AWS ecosystem is vast and wide. 
Um, they have great infrastructure, really amazing services um, that are container based, that are just, you know, code flow based. Um, and you don't really want to lock yourself into one and only specific model if it doesn't work for you because the functions model as great as it is does have a lot of limitations in terms of concurrency, you know, payloads, um, how many requests can run. Um, being able to batch things to multiple Lambda functions is pretty hard. Um, another, so, you know, if you want to take your code and you want to move it someplace else, that's just not doable. Um, second limitation is, you know, if, if you do want to uh, alert other downstream, sub downstream subscribers that something happened, if you, you know, want to um, combine this choreography with orchestration type of patterns, you need to do it through SNS only. Um, there is also a hard limit for 156 kilobytes for a payload. And so, you know, what happens if your users submit a larger payload or if something happens, you know, with you're basically going to need to re-architect your system and that can lead to a lot of costs and, and some some downtime too. Um, and then local development um, is generally great with AWS with step functions it's a bit cumbersome just because you know you do need to run an emulator to emulate step functions locally and you need Docker containers. Um, and then of course there is the overhead of maintaining um, JSON YAML definitions for the workflow with your code and they need to be in sync exactly with what's going on in your um, many Lambda functions and this thing will will just grow. Um, and then you also have limited observability. And what do we mean by that? Yes, you get like metrics and um, some logs for the uh, execution of step functions, but you know, in, in any modern system, uh, you don't live in isolation eventually, uh, or even in most cases, I would say from moment zero, actually, your system will interact with a database or another service, or it'll send a downstream message to a PubSub subscriber, um, or it'll talk to a state store or to a configuration store to get something. Um, and so you, you don't have uh, observability for those types of interactions uh, between your Lambda function and those, you, you have to write them in your code, right? So you have to, again, bring in another dependency into um, your code. If you want to use Datadog, you need you know to bring in the, the Datadog SDK. If you're using um, something like Dynatrace, Trace, you need the Dan Trace SDK. And of course, in Lambda, you're built by your execution time. So if you bring on more SDKs, it will delay the startup time for your Lambda function. And th that just creates more problems at scale. So um, not saying stuff functions isn't great, but um, sometimes if you need flexibility and your choice of infrastructure or compute, or you just want to scale it out to more compute uh, systems, or you have very specific requirements, um, you really want that flexibility that I talked about uh, earlier. Now I'm going to move out of this slide for a second and show you this um, great step functions uh, example that they have here. And what we'll do today is basically implement the same thing on AWS with AWS services. We could be using Lambda functions just as we use here, but we can actually use all um, AWS compute options and we'll still use you know, AWS RDS, we'll use SQS with SNS, and it'll be extremely AWS native, but this architecture will give us a lot more flexibility and choice. Um, and so if you look at this and we go to this uh, state machine JSON YAML here, um, this is basically the JSON I was talking about. And, you know, you'll notice it's long. It's very long, actually. And um, for me as a developer, if I'm now developing a new part of my system, um, it's very, very easy to forget to update, you know, my new function here and add a resource path and path and all of the parameters. and the specific, you know, coding primitives that they have in my code into this um, JSON file. Um, as a developer, I wish I could just use workflows in code as code uh, natively without, you know, needing to do anything else. And in terms of uh, domain-driven design, which I like, um, it's also a little bit more problematic because each each one of these needs to run as a separate Lambda function. That's just the limit of the, the architecture here. Um, and so we we get these different handlers. And here we're basically tying ourselves in code to a specific um, platform within AWS, which is AWS Lambda. So we cannot just take this code and then move it as is. We, you know, we have um, the async functions, we have uh, all of the programming model uh, primitives that we are first used by just using Lambda. And so it's great if it works for you, but if you want to then later move it, you're going to have to do a lot of stuff to move out of this. And then if we want to switch, you know, for different things from 
you know, being able to receive state from other state stores like DanMoDB or being able to notify uh, about notifications from other systems that are not SNS, then again, here we're basically tying ourselves to the infrastructure. And wouldn't it be great if we as developers could consume APIs and interfaces instead of concrete implementations? So how can we take our business domain logic, group it in a way that makes sense um, and make it much, much easier for people to find? Because Right now, if you look at this um, thing here, we don't have a clear entry point. Like, I don't know what's my clear entry point in the system. What is my first function that's gonna, you know, uh, get get invoked when someone, you know, tries to reserve a flight? Because this is eventually what the system does. It's a flight reservation system, um, and so we really have to go uh, through each one of these and and see what they do. Um, and they're kind of mixed. You have your different compensation mixed in with the um, with, with the functions for uh, doing the, the the orders and and the, the happy path, as, as I would say. And it gets pretty convoluted. Um, so with Catalyst workflows, we can actually have a a really nice and clear and concise programming model that lets you do this. So if we go back to the rhythm here and take a look at the diagram um, today, we're going to cover uh, this part of. Uh, invoking, you know, the different activities. I'll show you how we can also do um, uh, compensation. Um, we, we won't fire it um, for clarity and brevity and due to time. Um, we're, we'll be focusing on the main scenario here, but I'll show you how easy it is to, to actually write your, your own compensation logic. And you also get a lot of flexibility because, as I said earlier, your compensation logic um, can run distributed, but look like a monolith. And, and that's uh, really, really nice because you don't have to split it out and then run it as separate Lambda functions and have distributed logging and tracing and be able to aggregate stuff just to see, you know, how your uh, workflow um, is, is being executed. So I'm going to go back to uh, the slides here and from current slide. Um, yeah, so let's go into a demo. And what we're going to see in the demo is really the ability to code uh, as a monolith. So we're going to have a single reservation service, which is going to be a container, which means we can run it anywhere we want. We can run it on ECS. We can even run it on Lambda using the Lambda container runtime. Uh, we can run it on Elastic Beanstalk. We can run it on uh, Elastic Kubernetes service. We can run it locally on our machine. We can run it on an EC2 instance. We can really run it anywhere. Uh, in this demo, I'm going to be showing that on AWS App Runner, which is a great uh, service for accepting requests over HTTP. Um, and then we'll show how you can execute this durable, long-running workflow from AWS App Runner um, and get all of these benefits. And you can execute it multiple times, run multiple workflows. Again, all of the benefits of a microservices-based architecture. Um, and the, the main thing that we have in Catalyst is that you create an app ID. And an app ID is basically the projection of your service. So you start off by creating that. I'll show you that in a second. It gives you an API key. It gives you an API endpoint. And from there, you can just start issuing commands to save state, do pub sub, um, get secrets, and also execute workflows. This app ID can connect to various infrastructures. So remember, we talked earlier about flexibility. Um, and in this architecture, you can actually either use um, a Catalyst managed database if you want to, to save all of the workflow state, or you can actually bring your own database. And this is something really special because according to your uh, organizational policies, you know, you might be fine saving execution state on a serverless database, but, you know, if you're a large enterprise, if you're running in a highly regulated environment, whether it's banking or government, you might decide to save it in your own database. Um, and so what we allow you to do in Catalyst is actually to save the state inside of your own VPC, in your own database, um, using your own security groups and, and the, the security policies that your ops team loves and maintains. And uh, same goes for the uh, message broker. So for this case, we will actually do that. We will be saving state both in the uh, Catalyst managed workflow database that I'm going to show you. And then we're going to switch it over to bring our own AWS SQS database that they have running on my AWS account. Um, sorry, I meant Postgres database and, and send messages through AWS SQS. So yeah, I think we can uh, get started here. So first of all, let's go into the code itself. And this is my Python code. So the AWS example wasn't JavaScript. And uh, for funsies, I converted the entire thing to Python. Um, Python is like English, I like it. 
So first of all, what we can see is um, we have a simple entry point, and this is already so much clearer than having you know separate um, functions that must be uh, disconnected from each other and then basically uh, mesh together to create an entry point. So we have a static main, something that every developer knows and loves. Um, we're using Flask, so we get our choice of web server to host. This doesn't even have to be a web server, right? As a developer, um, I can choose whatever hosting infrastructure I want. This can be a gRPC server that um, I can get requests from and kick off a workflow out of. This can be Flask. This can be Fast API. Um, this can just be a script that you know runs once, gets its parameters from the command line, and then runs to completion. So um, flexibility really starts here. Um, and then the entry point is very clear. We have a reserve flight method. This is a post. And this is basically all you need to kick off the workflow. So we're getting the JSON request. Um, this is the you know flight order. This is usually what the website would send you. Um, and then um, we have a scheduled new workflow. So this is how we schedule uh, an execution. It's not a JSON um, structure that, that you have to build. Um, it's not anything that you have to write from an external definition. It's usually scheduled new workflow. You give it the input, which is a JSON um, that we're getting from the API request can literally uh, be anything. And then you have a task chain workflow here. Um, and this is really the crux of our uh, application, right? So we have activities, and this is basically a task chain pattern. So I'm calling an activity, which is, you know, to reserve flight, and then I'm taking that response, and I'm reserving a car, and after the car, I'm processing the payment. Um, if that's successful, I'm then confirming the flight, confirming the car, and then I'm notifying success. And this is where we're going to use PubSub. Um, so this is extremely clear, and for compensation, um, just because of time, I didn't implement that, but it would be extremely simple. Each one of these activities, you could just create one that's called reserve flight compensation, and that would call its own activity and basically do whatever logic you need to compensate for that. Um, and this is really it. So once we uh, catch an exception, we call a generic activity, and this is what I have here now. So this is my compensation logic to uh, print the error. Um, and basically error out. And this um, and what this means is that the workflow will run from its last step. It'll hydrate the state and it will continue um, until it's 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 able to uh, run to completion. Um, and if not, you have a lot of observability to you know fix what's wrong, redeploy your code, and and then uh, take the state and, and make the workflow run to completion. All right, so this is basically it. It's looking pretty simple. And the actual business logic I have here, I have that listed out in activities. So from a domain logic perspective, it's really easy. You know, from a DDD perspective, we have like a confirm, pay, reserve, and success. Um, and if we go to reserve, for example, um, this shouldn't be too complicated. It's just business logic. Um, we get the input, we check for parameters. Um, if we have a car class, then you know we reserve a car. Now, the reason why I don't have a specific car here, an excess car, is because there is lots of car companies that are using Dapper, and I don't want to get into a beef with any of them. So I'm not playing any favorites here. We're just going to call it extra small car if it's compact. Um, so for pay. Let's look, take a look at this because this is important. Remember how we said that you know you you need as a developer other things to interact with rather than you know not and not only just the workflow engine. This is a prime example, right? Let's say we want to save state that doesn't have anything to do with the workflow. So um, we want to save the payment, right, as part of the workflow, and we want to have other subscribers or other services which are not part of the workflow be able to get that state and examine it. And so we really need the ability to interact with another state store. So if this was you know, anything else other than Catalyst, which is the Dapper program model, I would need to tie myself into the uh, specific uh, database. Um, and you know, in most cases, it'd probably be the same database um, that's being used to, to store the uh, workflow execution stuff. But with Catalyst, we really get the best of both worlds. So um, with Catalyst, you can define any database you want. This can even be a Redis database mounted on Kubernetes or hosted on Kubernetes, and you can do uh, a call as simple as save state. And this is, isn't tied to any particular database. This is an abstraction over any database that you or your ops team uh, decides that they want to run. So in this case, it's called WorkflowDB, and I'll show you in a second how in Catalyst you can create different components um, with that name that um, really target different databases. So from your code perspective, this doesn't change, but if for some reason you wanted to restart the workflow and save the state to um, MySQL instead of Postgres, um, you would need to change anything in your code. 
Um, and this is another form of decoupling that I, I think we should really appreciate because oftentimes we speak of decoupling as things that we do in code, you know, we create abstractions in code, um, but wouldn't it really be awesome to have our application be decoupled in its life cycle than the underlying infrastructure, meaning we can make changes to the underlying infrastructure and we don't have to restart our application. We don't have to risk downtime. We don't have to risk data loss or business loss. We can just change things from the infrastructure perspective and our code stays the same. Um, and this is leading to a, a really good um, cohesive experience between ops and developer teams and platform teams also. So this is just an example of how you would save state to more than 50 different databases that um, Catalyst supports today. All right, so uh, I think we have most of it. The last thing I will show you is the uh, end event. So once the workflow runs to completion, we want to notify uh, someone that something succeeded. And again, um, if we were to do this, you know, with step functions, we'd need to use uh, uh, SNS notifications um, to have it be part of the uh, workflow execution. But um, with Catalyst workflows, we can actually just publish the state to any number of pub state brokers that Catalyst supports. It can be RabbitMQ, it can be SNS and SQS, which is what I'm going to use now. It's actually SQS and not SNS. Um, it's a combination of the two. Or it could be uh, MSK, which is Kafka based. It could even be a different pub sub provider running on a completely different cloud if I wanted to. And this is again done via a simple API call. So if I hop on over to the Catalyst UI, uh, this is my environment and I have an application ID. I'll just refresh um, the UI here to make sure that I'm on the latest, yes. And um, this is really simple. I'm not gonna create it again. What I did to create this, um, is just basically put a name here, you know, any name, and then I press on create app ID, and this is how we got to this reservation app ID. And this gives me an endpoint, which I have here, and an API token. Um, and this is unused, so we're not seeing any metrics, but you will be able to see a lot of really cool metrics. I'm not gonna deep dive into that. We have other videos and, and other content out there that shows you uh, what these metrics and access controls give you. Uh, today, we're really gonna be focusing on how to achieve this uh, uh, combined choreography and orchestration pattern on AWS. Um, and then this is one part of my application. So now my app running on AWS App Runner or Lambda or ECS or whatever um, compute I choose can talk uh, to these APIs and start issuing commands. And the second thing I have here are connections. So we have a connection that I created to talk to the AWS uh, SNS SQS uh, service that they have running within my organization. And this is my own state store. I have a Postgres SQL database that, that they have running. And if we click on that, we can see that, you know, we have connection details. Um, and the way to create that is also fairly simple. You have a really nice wizard. So let's say I want to create a state store. I'm just gonna uh, go here, go to Postgres SQL, uh, click on next. Um, this is a really nice zero trust security thing because I can actually pick which of my applications can talk to the database. So I'm just gonna pick the reservation service here, um, choose an authentication profile, you know, connection string, for example, um, and then put in the connection string and continue. So uh, I already have this stuff running, so I'm not gonna do this right now. If I hop over to the workflow section, we can see that um, the workflow database that's being used to save all of the state for workflow execution is uh, Diagrid. So we're using the Diagrid managed um, database for now. Um, but we're actually having the best of both worlds um, because if we hop over to connections, you can see that the name uh, here is workflow DB. And um, in my code, if I go back to it um, and I go to save state, you will see that I actually am using two data databases here, which is awesome for flexibility. I'm using my own PostgreSQL running in my own VPC to save state that's external, you know, uh, for the workflow, but all of the workflow state is being saved on the fully managed serverless um, Catalyst database. And later on, we're, we're gonna switch um, and we're gonna have our Postgres database also be used for the workflow execution. But now this is really great because uh, my database doesn't need to be hammered with requests that are really infrastructure requests, right? It's like execute the state or save the, the, the state of this specific activity that I'm launching. Um, but my application state, which is visible to people who query the state and need to do, to do something actionable on it, um, is available to them. So again, this is getting the best of both worlds here. Um, and this is a really nice platform that they can just layer on top of my infrastructure. So with no further ado, let's see this uh, working. Now, uh, we were to mention earlier, um, this is an early access preview. You know, things might not work, but um, 
this is basically the these are basically the guarantees that you should get from the system. So first of all, let's start with a local development experience. I'm going to run this thing locally, and then we're going to take it to the cloud. Um, so we have uh, three things that we need to run this entire thing locally. The same thing, the same way we're running it in the cloud. One of the major benefits here is portability. You don't need emulators. You don't need Docker containers. You don't need uh, anything. You don't even need a Diagrid CLI. Like you can do this without downloading a single Diagrid uh, piece of machinery into your system to do this. The only thing you need are um, two endpoints, um, a port and an API token. So I already have all of these and um, I will show you what they look like. So I basically had uh, three exports, Dapper HTTP endpoint, Dapper gRPC endpoint, and Dapper API token. It took me about five seconds to do that. Um, and once these are in place, we can actually start orchestrating the workflow. So I am going to uh, do Python 3 uh, app py, and this is working. We can see that Flask is, has the web server running, so we can now start issuing commands to it. And we can see that the, um, uh, the workflow engine locally is connected to the remote sidecar in the cloud. So now I can go here, and I'm targeting my local development machine. And in my body, I have a very simple JSON file. I have a first name, which is hello, last name, which is there. Um, location I'm going to is Spain, and the car class is compact, right? So I'm just going to uh, shoot this thing over. And um, if we go here, we can actually see the uh, workflow execution uh, ran. It ran to completion, so I should see done here. And there we go. We see done. Um, and we can see the, the different activities outputting the different information. So what's cool about this is... Um, and I'm just going to zoom in a little more. You can actually see, you know, the received input, which is what we sent. And then we can see the enrichment process going on where each step of the activity is actually based on uh, its own, you know, activities, adding data to it, saving it to our Postgres database. The workflow execution is saved within the uh, Catalyst serverless database. And uh, we, we really get the best of both worlds. Our application database is uh, free to serve application level requests and all of the infrastructure stuff is saved on the Catalyst side. Um, and so this is no defined success. So this means we should have also um, sent this notification to our um, SQS instance here. Uh, let me find that, which is this um, publishing event and let's cancel this one. Um, so I basically um, published the event. Oops. So if we go back here and we go to uh, my SQS instance. This is this is it. Let's pull for messages, and we can see the message. So if we click on it, cool. so this is the the event that that we got. Um, we get another really nice thing um, with this body because Dapper um, and by extension Catalyst will actually wrap all of your information in cloud events, and this is useful for many reasons, right? Um, first of all, you have a unique ID um, that the Catalyst platform subscribes to this message, you can see who sent it. So you can verify the identity of the publisher. So we know it's the reservation system, right? If it's not that you might not wanna um, need to, um, to process it. Uh, you can see the topic that it was sent to, and then you get the trace parent, which is great because if you have a downstream subscriber that wants to have a complete flow and show everything that's going on in terms of distributed tracing, you can tra take this trace parent, send it off to the next call in your chain, um, and that will basically give you um, a very holistic and complete call graph between all of the different components of your application. Um, and, you know, of course, you, you can see the signature. Um, yeah, and uh, this is pretty great because you get a whole bunch of metadata uh, that you can get. You can also just send the data itself. It's called a raw payload. Um, Catalyst supports that, but um, cloud events are really nice because they, they do give you um, all of these uh, nice metadata aspects that you can use for better decision making in your code, honestly. Okay, so we got that and we'll just go ahead and delete it for now because we're gonna be running this workflow again. Um, and I basically took this code completely unchanged and I dockerized it so that I can move it to any platform within AWS or you know, on just a VM or even on my machine running it locally, right? If, if I wanna test that the code in the container works, I can just run this thing locally in my machine, um, on my machine and it'll work. Really, really simple Docker uh, file, no, just an MD Python. Uh, image running the same command that I used to run it locally, copying the uh, uh, activities. Um, the requirements file is extremely small. Uh, we're just using Flex and the uh, Dapper SDK, which is needed to um, save the state and, and do the, the workflow orchestration from our code. Um, yeah, 
And now I can basically take this and run it on AWS. So let's see if this thing runs as is um, on the first try in the cloud. So I have my AWS App Runner instance here, which as I mentioned earlier, it's a serverless container platform. I personally love it. Um, it's so easy to just get up and started with a container that can auto scale very easily with custom domains and everything you have. Um, and this is really good, you know, instead of running a gazillion Lambda functions and other types of uh, JSON YAML based orchestrations and being able to needing to maintain all of that stuff in CACD, um, I get all of the benefits of just writing my code as if it's a monolith, you know, having a single Docker container that I can test and then move from my local machine to dev to staging to prod, um, but then get this, you know, very modern microservices based um, app, a system that will auto scale my code and my, my code will um, basically be able to handle multiple requests coming in. Um, so I have this thing uh, deployed here, and I also have a separate uh, line here for um, logs. So we can see that uh, it's successfully connected to the remote sidecar too, um, and we have the exact same code. I have my environment variables um, in my configuration here. So um, if I'm gonna click on that, I'm gonna see the um, API token and uh, everything that I need. Um, yes, you can use this to, to talk to um, Catalyst right now, but I'm gonna be um, rotating that token in just a second, so that's fine. So you see, this is all we need to do to basically um, talk to the Catalyst API. Okay, cool. So um, now we have this thing running and I am gonna go here and take a look at my default domain. I'm gonna go back into Postman and just issue the same command, same body um, into this uh, URL here. And oh, we can already see that it's done. If we go back to the logs and yeah, we can see the exact same output that we saw locally. We saw the enrichment, we saw it taking place. Um, it's it's all running fine. Um, and we, we ran the workflow to completion. And now we should also be able to see um, inside of our AWS service, if I pull for messages, then yes, we see this here. So let's assume that this is all amazing stuff, but as a developer, let's say that, you know, you need to sw switch out your database and you don't want to maintain the execution state inside of the Catalyst database anymore. You want to run it on Postgres SQL. So how would you go about doing that? Well, first of all, I would go into projects here. Um, I would right click on this and disable managed workload. So the first thing this is going to do is it's going to disable the uh, database that Catalyst provides you with automatically uh, when you create a new project. Um, and this is going to just um, take a, a few seconds. Um, and something that I forgot to show you um, actually was the, the workflow execution. So we have an amazing UI um, to show you this, um, the, the execution state. Let's, uh, now I'm going off script. I'm re-enabling the, the managed state store um, so that we can call a workflow again and, and really show this awesome UI because to me, this is more important than actually switching out the, the database. So let's go to the project and we can see that it's provisioning. Hopefully it's gonna come back. Um, yeah, we can see that the app ID is ready. This one is still provisioning. Um, and we, I basically disabled the state store and I re-enabled it and it's gonna take a while, probably like a minute or so for this thing to uh, come back on. Eventually it should be provisioning again. And due to time, I'm probably gonna skip the, the part where we switched to our own uh, Postgres database, but we'll see. Let me refresh this to make sure that I'm actually seeing the latest. Yeah, we're gonna wait for this because it's, it is very important for me to show you um, the workflows UI. Um, something great that we actually built here is this durable execution uh, backflow log. So every time you launch a workflow, you'll be able to see all of the workflow items shown here, you'll be able to see the execution ID. You'll be able to deep dive into the actual inputs and outputs that are um, going uh, into this. And looks like this is still provisioning. Um, let's let's try and use this thing anyway uh, because our reservation system is ready. So let's uh, do this thing with uh, our application. Let's go here. We send the workflow, and let's see what our logs show us. So we're seeing this, is this the latest? Yes, looks like it's it's already working. All right, great. So the workflow executed again, must be a UI thing here. And we're gonna go into workflows and this doesn't come up. So probably um, this needs to run fully to the end. Um, but after it is able to run and if you, uh, you know, join the, the early access, you will be able to see that you see all of your workflow state here. 
um, once your workflow state store is finished provisioning. Um, yeah, and I think we're out of time, so I'm gonna uh, finish with that. You also have an API Explorer if you wanna test out the individual notifications. So for example, if I wanna test out the notification outside of my code, um, I can just send a message to the reservation API. I can bring in my topic here, um, which can be really anything. Um, and I can just uh, test this API directly, um, which is awesome. So we've just basically sent a message to a new state. And if I go into my PostgreSDB, and this is the database, the AWS PostgreSQL database that they had running inside of my own VPC, and we go to the database here and into uh, schemas, we can see that we've got two tables and we've got the state table and I'm just gonna uh, click on that and use the query tool. And I'm just gonna do select star from state and I'm gonna see all my states. So something really interesting here is that we have um, all of these different keys, but, and I'm just gonna zoom in. Um, there's two types of, of keys that you see here. Um, Let's talk about both of them. I'm just going to, do, going to find one. Yeah, so this, for example, is our application state. Um, and this is our app ID with the key that we saved. This is the external state. It's saved as a, a JSON blob. Um, and the other type of workflow here is basically the workflow state. So this is from a previous attempt where I actually used the Postgres SQL database as my workflow database. So um, this is uh, to show you that you can actually use the same database, um, both for saving the external state and also the workflow state. And I could basically you know, dissect this any way possible. Um, I could cho choose to save my application state on my own database, which is PostgreSQL. And then I could choose to, for example, store the workflow state on also my own database in my VPC, which is DynamoDB or MySQL or even something running on a Kubernetes cluster. So this flexibility is um, really, really great. Um, yeah, so this is the provisioning, the, the state store, um, probably just a bug, but um, I've just showed you basically uh, what it means.